All right, this one is about a fair coin which has two distinct flat sides. One of these sides bears the image of a face and the other one does not. So no face there. When the coin is tossed, the probability that the coin will land face up. Face up simply means what? When this face comes up, the probability of this is 1 by 2. But if this is 1 by 2, then automatically we can also infer that the probability that it comes face down, that's also 1 half. So I'll just put both of these here, face up and face down, both one half. How am I so sure? Well, it's only two different faces, right? It's either face up or face down. One of them is half, the other one is one minus half. Okay, let's read further. For certain values of M, N, B, Q, okay, four, four variables, when M pair coins are tossed simultaneously, the probability that all M coins land face up, this probability is P. So let me mathematically express this situation. Let's think. So M coins are tossed and you want to talk about the probability that all of them land face up. So if all M land face up, it means the first one is face up, second one face up, third one face up and so on. What is the probability of the first one landing face up? Well, that's just half from here. So it's half for the first coin. Then again, it will be half for the second coin. I'm multiplying because there's an and. This happens and then the next coin also and then the next coin also. This thing you keep doing for all M coins. So essentially, you will see one half multiplied with itself M times. So you can keep this in a neater form this way. One upon 2 to the power m. So we're taking capital M here like this. This is what p is as per the line here, that p is the probability for this happening. Okay, we've completely translated this. Now let's read further. When n fair coins are tossed simultaneously, then the probability is q that all of them land face up. So it's exactly the same, just that instead of m, you will now have n, and instead of this probability p, you will now have q. Let me write this. Perfect. I've just written that. I just changed M to N and I changed this to Q. So this way then I have these two expressions which tell me what P and Q are in terms of M and N. So there's some connection I found about these four variables. Now there's more information coming. It says M is less than N and 1 by P plus 1 by Q is equal to 72. Now I know P and Q are also connected with M and N through these relationships and this one is also about M and N. So I will put this in the form of an equation. One form of course is what you see in the question itself in the form of P and Q. Another I'll simply do this here and get it in terms of P and Q in terms of M and N. But before we really do all of that processing we should see whether we need to. So we'll quickly look at what the question is asking. If you found the analysis of this data set helpful then hit that like button so that other GMAT aspirants can also learn from it. And to stay tuned with such content, hit the subscribe button below. Now, to take your learning to the next level, we have put together a free trial in which you can experience content in all the sections tested on GMAT Focus Edition. For example, you can build your CR pre-thinking skills, you can learn how to approach statistics questions in graphics interpretation as part of DI, you can learn everything about linear inequalities as tested on the GMAT Focus Edition and a lot of other content. The link for this is in the description. Now, let's get back to the question at hand. And here we go. It says you have to select a value for M and N that are jointly consistent with all of the information that you just read. Okay, so I need to find M and N and therefore I will definitely need to do more here. This equation, which is in terms of P and Q right now, is my only hope because once I get this in terms of M and N, I will have an equation in M and N. As of now, all I have is just this comparison between M and N. So now I know I do need to use these three things together. So what I'll do is I'll simply put this as the value of P and I'll put this as the value of Q in this parent equation. Let's see. This is exactly what you'll have when you simply do the substitution. Now, because this is a complex fraction, something divided by something again by something else, I know I can simply take the 2 to the power m and 2 to the power n in the numerator. And this then is a neater equation that I have in terms of m and n. And this, along with the information that m is less than n, these are the only things I have to be able to find m and n. So let's see how we can use this. At this point, let me ask you this. Could you have arrived at the approach of solving this question with this level of clarity had you not spent the effort in thoroughly understanding the information presented? Such is the power of the process of owning the data set. And because this skill may not come naturally to many of you, we have created a course architecture that ensures that we teach you this skill through every guided quiz in the EGMAT DI course and we reinforce the same in every practice quiz.
In fact, in the TPA quant modules in the two-part analysis course, we teach you how to get comfortable with this question type. You will gain the confidence to handle any question of this type in the most efficient manner. We serve more than 58 specially curated questions at the right progression so that you can learn various aspects of this question type, including the process skills of inference, translate and visualize. Thus, throughout the DI course, through around 500 questions, you will learn such process skills so that you can also comfortably use the owning the data set approach. Let's now get back to the solution at hand. There are actually two methods in which we can do that. One is by taking help of the choices that we have and just finding out, you know, what M and N can give you 72. Another is an inference based method where we will be able to solve this and get the values of M and N straight, then just go into the choices and mark. So first I'll show you how you can use the choices to answer this. Here we are. These are your choices. These are the choices for M and N, which are the numbers that you have in your powers. Actually, you're looking for 2 to the power M and 2 to the power N, so that when you add those two numbers, you get 72. So for these choices of M and N, I'm going to write 2 to the power M and 2 to the power N. Basically, both of them have the same choices. So I'm just going to write what that value is. So when I do a 2 squared, that's 4. 2 to the power 3 is 8. 2 to the power 4 is 16. Same way, you can quickly get all of the values. Now, because these these values represent these two numbers. I just have to see which two numbers here can I add to get 72. Let me think about them one by one. If I take 4, can I add 4 with something to get 72? No, 4 plus 68 would be 72, but 68 is not anywhere in the list. So 4 is completely out. It cannot be any of these two entire numbers. Now if I take 8, what is 8? 8, 8, when I add what to it, will it become 72? 8 plus 64, and I have my values then. That means one of them, one of these values, 2 to the power m and 2 to the power n, one of them is 8, the other one is 64. So basically what that means is that one of my m n values is 3, the other one is 6. At this point, I need to know which one one is m and which one is n, right? Now for this, we had another piece of information. We knew that m is less than n. So the smaller one is m for us, here this one, and the greater one is n. And that's it. So this question we could do through choices. The numbers were not very big. You could calculate and you could see, you know, all of these cases to see where 72 was coming. But this is a method which will work only on this question. As these things keep changing, obviously it's not always the same structure that will be asked. For those cases, simple plugging in like this is not really building any skill in you. That skill you will build when we discuss the inference based method that I said. That will be building a core skill in you, how to solve an equation like this so that no matter what question comes, you'll be able to handle it. It's a more scalable method. Let's see that now. Look, first of all, right now this is a sum of some powers of 2, both of which I don't know. Easier is always to express this thing as a product of numbers. Because when you factor things, then you can cancel things from the right side, make more inferences. So here, first thing that I can do is take 2 to the power m common. Because m is less than n, obviously all of the 2's that are here will also be contained in 2 to the power n. When I take that common, I will be left with this on the inside. Now, if you see, the left side I've already expressed as all all powers of 2 here, basically this is the even factor. Well, this, because it's a power of 2, even plus 1, this is the odd factor. Which means if I split 72 as a product of two numbers that are 1 even, 1 odd, I will have a lot more to talk about. So when I do that, 72 is actually the same as 8 times 9. This is where I have odd times even. Now then, I can compare the even sides here. These two are the even numbers, so they have to be equal. Similarly, this entire odd number should be equal to 9. That's it. So when I use these two things one by one, first of all, 2 to the power m equal to 8 means m is 3 because 2 cubed is 8. Next, 2 to the power n minus m plus 1 is 9. Again, gives you first that 2 to the power something is 8, which means even this power is 3. Now you will use what you knew about m from the previous case to get n as 6. And that's it. Solving this was very easy. Only thing important was how to solve. Let's summarize everything here. So first, we began by carefully understanding everything that was given to us. A lot of translation was needed here. First, we inferred from here that if face up probability is half and face down is also half, although we never used it anywhere in the question, but they very well could have used one of these as n lands, you know, all of these land face down. Even then, your expression would have been the same. After that, we translated these two bits of information, this red bit about m coins and this green bit about n coins 
times and we created these two neat equations that connected two of these four variables at a time. Then we had more information about M and N here and P and Q here. But since we saw in the question that it wants us to find M and N, it meant we have to make use of this equation along with these two so that we can create something in terms of M and N. Once we did that creation, we got this equation in terms of M and N. We simplified it to this. Now solving any equation is always easier when you have it in the factored form because then you can simplify. So we created our factors by taking all of the twos out common. Once that approach was set on how we're going to solve this equation, then just comparing both sides and getting the values, that was straightforward. So we got m equal to 3 and n equal to 6, which are right here and done.